Manager Meetings is brought to you by Canalyst, the leading destination for public company data and analysis. Tons of funds we know use Canalyst to get exactly what you'd want for analytical work on companies. They have detailed company-specific models on over 4,000 global equities with clean data, timely adjustments, and relevant KPIs. And each one is available at the click of a button. I've personally found Canalyst models especially helpful as a primer for important positions in advance of manager meetings. So no surprise that their client roster includes a host of allocators too. If you haven't checked out Canalyst recently, I strongly suggest you do. They've been busy extending coverage, building sector-specific dashboards, and just launched a data science library for systematic investors. Sign up for your free trial at canalyst.com slash TED. I'm Ted Seides, and this is Manager Meetings. This show is an exploration of investment opportunities. Through conversations with money managers conducted by one of the manager's institutional clients, we'll share the stories and strategies that attracted their attention and capital. You can learn more and join our mailing list at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted, guest hosts, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their respective firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators, the firms of guest hosts, or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities or managers discussed on this podcast. On today's manager meeting, Paul Valent interviews Steve Drobny. Paula is a legend in the endowment world and recent guest on Capital Allocators, who's now serving as the chief investment officer for Rockefeller University's $2.5 billion endowment after spending 20 years at the helm of Bowdoin College's endowment. Steve is the founder and managing partner of Clock Tower Group, an alternative asset management platform whose activities include seeding and investing in global macro hedge funds, fintech venture capital, China-focused seeding, climate change venture capital, and macro research. Their conversation covers the changing global landscape, geopolitics, China, fintech, Latin America, and ESG. Steve also shares his candid contrarian opinion of the endowment model. Please enjoy this manager meeting with Steve Drobny from the Clock Tower Group. Steve, it's great to see you. I know a lot of people are not familiar with you because you're sort of a hidden gem. So I thought we could start with the elevator pitch of your background and what the Clock Tower Group is. Sure, Paul, and thanks for doing this. I'm a little bit media shy, press shy. I like to focus on my clients and our investments rather than myself. And as you know from coming to our events, I'm never on stage. I never talk. And so this is quasi uncomfortable for me. But I'm excited to do it with you because I'm a huge fan of yours. And so it's a real honor to be here with you, Paula. So Clock Tower Group is an alternative asset management platform that offers bespoke products to our clients. We look to identify investment opportunities that are difficult to source, access, monitor, or understand. We start with a top-down framework from our macro core. And we have a relationship-based investing style. That's the core of what we do. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But we employ a go-anywhere-do-anything attitude. We're in Santa Monica. We're not in New York. We're not in San Francisco. We're not in London. We're not like other people. We're kind of wacky. We don't dress right. We don't look right. We don't act right. But that's kind of the point. We think that the real gems of the investment world are found in the cracks in between what everyone's doing. So you'll never find us doing multifamily housing. You won't find us doing LBO private equity. You'll find us in the weird corners of the world, but working with super smart, large pools of capital that understand they can't be everywhere all the time and do everything. And so we work very closely with our clients in a very collaborative, consultative, in-the-tent type of approach and work in very weird areas like global macro, seeding, onshore China, early stage venture capital investing in fintech and climate. But we really focus on the clients most in human capital and relationships is kind of number one for us. It's why we host our annual macro and venture events that you've been to, small, unique, high level. And it's why we've just really dig in on the travel and off the run type stuff. 
I think you're a little modest about your background. I think that you are one of the most innovative out of the box thinkers and you're right, you're non-conventional. You're sort of a surfer dude. You have a accounting degree, a master's degree from London School of Economics. You've written three really good books about global macro and about the investing environment. You're passionate about surfing. And I love the way you think back differently. So I think you under present yourself. I think you're amazing. So I am going to start this discussion with a rule that you always have at your conferences. I'm giving you one slide only to discuss what you're most interested in. What is the content of this slide? What I'm most interested in is where the world's going. That's what global macro is. Global macro starts with a blank slate of paper and looks forward as to what's happening in the world and has the widest scope of investment choice of anything in the world. It can be any product, any instrument, any time frame, any, anything. And it's about where we are today and where we're going. I think most investors and investment categories really focus on what has happened, what was the price, where's the price going to go because based off of this earnings multiple or, or this historical precedent. How do I put that on one slide? It's just a picture of the globe and having unlimited choices, daunting but exciting. And endowments and foundations have been slow to embrace macro strategies, but global macro goes through periods of underperformance and everyone throws it out the window. Right now it's doing really well because there's this disruption in commodity markets, rates, FX, the yield curve. And so you started in 2005, you wrote your book Inside the House of Money, and you interviewed people like Scott Besson, Jim Rogers, Jim Leitner. And then you followed that up in 2021 with the new House of Money and the Jim Chanos, Kyle Bass. So what's changed in global macro between those two books? Well, I think macro is really hard for people to understand or wrap their heads around because there are no rules in, in macro. There are no restrictions. There are no limitations. And because it's unlimited in that sense, investors just want to ignore it because they can't understand it. There's very few endowments, foundations that invest in it. You're unique among them. And macro has its moments where it's working and times where it's not working, just like any other investment category. And it's had a tough run for the last several years because equities were going straight up. You got to think of macro really in a portfolio context as a diversifier. If you're running a big pool of capital right now, what are your diversifiers? Bonds aren't a diversifier anymore. There's not many short sellers left. You mentioned Jim Chanos, who's a legend and incredible, but there are not many short sellers left. It's very hard to find diversifying strategies anymore. If you're in hedge funds, most of them would be equity, growth equity, tech equity, equity long short, which is really equity long. And venture strategies, private equity, real estate, they're all equity strategies. And so if you look at your portfolio, you're going to be long S&P, basically. So macro provides a diversifier. And if it's not working, great. The rest of your portfolio is working. But when the rest of your portfolio is not working, like Q1 of this year, macro managers generally, usually will be there to bail you out. Yeah, and you've been seeding and finding new emerging macro managers, as well as advising large pensions and large institutional funds on macro. It's hard to find the next Stan Drucker Miller or George Soros or whoever. How do you identify the next great macro manager? What do you look for? First of all, I think the macro managers you have in your portfolio are important for CIOs to help you inform your whole portfolio, right? So you at Rockefeller run a macro fund. Ontario Teachers runs a macro fund. Sovereign Wealth Funds run macro funds. They need to deploy capital where the world's going. And if you call your typical investment manager that you allocate capital to, if you call your private equity manager, they love private equity. If you call the real estate manager, they love real estate right now. They loved it in 07. They loved it in 09. They loved it in 2019. They love it today. So they don't really provide you much information. A macro manager who is looking at the world from the standpoint of where is it going from today is going to give you some insights into how you should deploy your capital. Now, the hedge fund world has gotten a lot tougher over the last decade. Getting capital is a lot tougher. Starting a fund is a lot tougher. The rise of platforms, the big change from 2005 to today is the rise of platforms, where if you're going to launch a fund, your alternative is someone at a large platform say, here's your pool of capital, here's your infrastructure, here's your technology, here's your accounting, don't run your own fund, we'll make you pretty much an equivalent economic deal to do it under my umbrella. The problem with that is, is that you're not building value, you're not building your own business, you're not creating value, you can get stopped out and be fired tomorrow or 
someone else has a problem in the firm and capital is reduced for whatever reason. But that said, starting your own fund today is incredibly hard with people, compliance, capital, PB agreements, all this kind of stuff that is table stakes requires a significant chunk of capital. So running around with your hat out, raising fives and tens from your rich uncle doesn't really work anymore, which is how Stan and George and Paul and all these guys started. I mean, some of these funds started with $7 million, with $12 million, with nothing, but you can't do that anymore. So we start managers with several hundred million dollars with more behind that if they do well from a syndicate of large pools of capital around the world that are looking for the next great manager, but don't have the time, resources, or energy, or it's just not worth their time given the size of capital they're running to do it. But when and if it works, they already have a deal with us to add significantly and make these managers a core position for them. And in the meantime, they get all the information rolled up to them from what macro managers are thinking, which can be really helpful when you're running a big pool, as we discussed. One of the things I agree with you that conversations with macro managers are really important. I think you were quoted saying hedge funds have to transform into service businesses, offering transparency and value beyond returns. Some of the best investments I have made have been after discussions with macro managers who either frightened me out of an investment or made me sort of lean into an investment. So I totally agree with you. You on your staff, you have Marco Papik, who works with you and provides really topical insights on macro opportunities and challenges. And how do you leverage his research, both in your funds that you run, as well as with your consulting clients? Yeah, so we view asset management, investment management as a consulting business, right? So you have the buyers who are the asset owners and all of us who provide investment returns. But we think that on top of investment returns, you should provide information, whether it's through what you're doing in private capital, hedge funds, macros. Everyone should be an open book with their investors. We sit on top of a lot of information from our clients, managers, network, et cetera, that I wanted to put in one place. So we created this strategy unit and brought Marco on board several years ago to be the point person for our clients. If you think about who has perfected this, Bridgewater's perfected this. They have the Bridgewater Daily, which is for most institutional investors, a required daily reading. They spend a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of people to do that. And as a result, voila, they have the world's largest hedge fund. So you treat your clients well, you look after them, you provide value on top of returns, and you get more clients and more assets. It's that simple. So they've perfected it. We're doing our own version of it where Marco and our strategy team provide information on where the world's going, what we're seeing, what we're hearing through reports, through phone calls, through on-site visits, and then through our events where we gather a couple times a year. Some are cool. Marco is a rock star. Marco's been on this podcast with Ted Seides, so you should listen to that. But Marco's incredible. He's an incredible brain. He has not come up through traditional channels. He's self-taught, but he focuses on geopolitics. And there's very few good geopolitical thinkers out there. Most of them tell you what they think. Like, I think this could happen. or I think that can happen. Similar to like a two-armed economist, right? A lot of geopolitical thinkers are two-armed geopolitical thinkers. <laughs> but Marco has a real framework-based approach that he's written in his book, Geopolitical Alpha, which he wrote during COVID. And he's an incredible thinker, thinks very long-term and is very different. And so as the world, when I looked at who we wanted to lead our strategy unit, and I looked at the world of financial thinkers out there, most of them were monetary policy based, Fed focused. I think the Fed is going to cut rates by 25 bips and the Bank of England is going to do this and currency is going to do that. And I didn't want that, especially in a zero rates world. In a zero rates world, I thought we were shifting to a place where really it's fiscal and geopolitics that matter, especially after 2016 when you had Brexit and Trump. I think the world really changed and Marco came on board and has just crushed it for our clients and our seeds and in our network. I want to talk to another one of your very smart hires, Wei Lu, who is probably one of the most in the forefront of identifying opportunities in China. And you have an office in Shanghai. And I love reading his insights because I think he's probably one of the best thinkers about China. But with the war in Ukraine and a bit of wariness around the relationships with Russia and China, how are you thinking about the landscape in China? And is that still a critical part of your firm? It's a piece of the firm that's important. And I think understanding China is incredibly important for global investors. So our network or our client base are generally triple digit billion pools of capital that have assets all over the world. And 
for them to ignore China would be just stupid. You could ignore Russia because their economy is smaller than the size of Texas. But China is somewhere between 15 to 25 percent of global GDP, depending on how you count and what numbers you believe. And it is also and has been one of the fastest growing areas of the world. And so having an understanding of China, whether you invest there or not, is incredibly important to how you invest. Wei and I have worked together for over a decade, and we put together an office and team there years ago and started investing in onshore Chinese hedge fund managers about three, four years ago at the request of our clients who are looking to get more insight and information in terms of what's going on in China. And there is no better way to get intel from allocating to managers and communicating with them. And if you want to understand what's going on in China, you got to be invested there. So we have an office there and we have a team there in China. And I think what's interesting is that post-COVID, it's become all that more important. First of all, Wei was there in Wuhan in 2019 when COVID started and was reporting back to our clients. Similarly, some of these latest trends with education and social reform, we've been communicating very closely with our clients. But most large pools of capital, most investors have not been to China since 2019. I'm sure you're included. When are you going to go there again? Probably not for another year, two or three. And so you either just don't do China, which is fine. Rockefeller, you can decide that with 2 to $3 billion. But if you have $100 billion, $200 billion in assets, you can't ignore it. And to do it yourself without traveling there is very difficult. And so we are increasingly serving as a bridge to our clients who need onshore intelligence and information and access. That's amazing. Before we leave the macro side, I want to talk. In 2016, I invited you to an endowment conference, and you did a presentation on Portfolio Management 4.0 for endowments, where 3.0 was David Swenson's The Yale Model, and then prior to that, it was 60-40 and all that. In that discussion, you underline the fact that macro should be in institutional portfolios as an important asset class. So are you still married to Portfolio Management 4.0? What has changed since then? In some ways, everyone follows the Yale model and we're lemmings and we all do the same thing. And I, I love talking to you because you're so out of the box sometimes. And I think that has benefited the portfolios that I have run. So what's your thought on the endowment management 4.0, 5.0? Where are we? Well, first of all, David Swinson was a genius identifying, partnering with managers and running a diversified pool of capital when he did back in the late 90s. The problem with it today, as we discussed, is that most of the investments are equity allocations. And so you're basically getting a levered S&P position. I think that, and by the way, that's been great up until three months ago. So from 2016, when I made that presentation to Nancy Segethi's conference, to three months ago, I looked like an idiot. And I am an idiot. I don't know anything. Nobody knows anything, but I really don't know anything. I just partner with really smart people and hope that that wins the day. But the idea is that if you're running a large pool of capital, your job is to decide what your beta allocations are, whether it's equities, bonds, real estate, cash, that kind of stuff. And how you decide that the information in those weightings is driven by your inputs, which I think macro managers, as discussed, provide the best forward-looking inputs to that process. That is Real Money 4.0. Real Money 3.0, the Yale model, was great in a declining bond and vol and interest rate environment, inflation environment. And the question now is, have we seen the bottom of inflation and rates? And if we have that model is probably not going to be so great going forward. Mm, Agreed. So let's move to uh, private investments. Your firm has launched small venture funds, primarily in the fintech area, both in the U.S. and Latin America. And you're an early investor. You don't usually take lead or board seats. Can you tell us a little bit about your strategy and why fintech of all sectors that you focus parallel to the macro strategies? Yeah. So... As we discussed, we throw an annual macro conference with kind of a who's who in the institutional investor space, macro CIOs, real estate venture, politicians, academics, athletes, artists, an eclectic group of 100 or so people get together once or twice a year, and we talk about where the world's going. We've been doing this for a long time, and in 2014, being based in L.A., seeing what was happening in Silicon Valley, seeing what's happening in technology, 
we thought there's a real opportunity to get involved in technology here, but not in traditional tech, not in consumer, not in social, not in gaming, things that we don't really understand. We thought there was a huge trend coming in fintech. And so in 2015, we stood up a vehicle to invest in financial technology startups. Because we were new to the VC landscape, we did not lead. We did not take board seats. We just co-invested. And that's been just an amazing thing that has persisted where as venture capital firms have gotten overcapitalized and raised tons of money and fintech has become a word that everybody's heard now and it's become a hot space, all these VCs are competing to lead deals, take board seats and get their percentage share that they need to ownership of a company and then protect that. Where we're sitting here saying, well, we just want to invest in the best companies and put as much capital to work as we can and partner with VCs and not be their competitor, but be their partner. And we're now in 150 or so companies. We throw one of the best fintech events in the world that's going to be soon in Santa Barbara. And we just get to see all these opportunities and generally get into the deals we want to get into versus we have a very high hit rate. And we're just seen as like a little bit of a Switzerland in the fintech space. You know, like we're not anybody's enemy, not anybody's competitor. And that allows us to play where we want to play. Yeah. And you invest across insurance, payments, you invest across the whole thing, but you're not doing things in blockchain or crypto, right? Because that's an area that you're going to leave for other people. Well, we're investing in the equity of businesses that are going after pre-existing revenue and profit pools like banking insurance, et cetera. Crypto, blockchain, we think is much more of a technology play where the deep technologists understand this the best. And crypto blockchain is either going to work and be adopted by the world or not. And so right now I hear the word constantly, we're in the early innings, but crypto has been going on since 2008 now. So we're 14 years into it. And there still isn't really a core use case other than speculation and capital raising. There's no businesses that use the blockchain other than than coins that people bet on. And the good businesses have been the exchanges, Coinbase, FTX, Binance, et cetera, that facilitate this trading. And so we know a lot of great people in crypto, a lot of smart people that are core technologists have been in the space for a long time. And we point our clients to them and say, you should invest in them because they're the experts. In fintech, we're going after existing pools of profit and revenue that are being disrupted by technology. And by the way, the thesis behind fintech is that in every country in the world, financial services is generally somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of market cap and GDP. And so if you can disrupt that, that's a big piece of profits and revenues to go after and build good businesses on. We're going to take a quick break in the action to talk to you about Coinbase Institutional the first choice for institutions investing in digital assets. Over 11,000 institutional clients use Coinbase's secure, comprehensive, and scalable products to manage their digital assets, including Coinbase Prime and Exchange. Coinbase also recently announced that they're on a path to launching derivatives. As the only publicly traded company with experience trading and custodying crypto assets at scale, Coinbase Institutional executes some of the largest trades in the industry for futuristic companies. Invest with the most trusted name in crypto and learn more by visiting coinbase.com slash institutional. I have been very interested in Latin America. It was horrible for a while, but now it's getting more interesting. And you've done fintech. You're one of the most prolific investors, I think, in fintech in Latin America. And it's interesting because it's underbanked. It has great internet penetration, talented entrepreneurs. So are there any other areas besides Latin America that you see are going to be transformed by fintech that you would invest in? Well, I think every country will be disrupted by technology, and that is going to continue and not going to change. The question really is just about multiples and valuations, and do they go up or down at this point, at the late stage? In the early stage, which is where we play, things are constantly being disrupted by technology. And in Latin America, this is just an example of just being on the field and trades coming to you. So we're out there investing in early stage fintech, and all of a sudden there is just a deluge of opportunities coming at us from Latin America. COVID has changed a lot of things. Technology used to be in San Francisco, Silicon Valley. And now I think Sam Altman from Y Combinator said the next Silicon Valley is everywhere. And I think COVID has accelerated that trend. So you've seen a lot of talented entrepreneurs who were originally from Latin America who moved to San Francisco or New York, all moving home to do startups because now there's capital that you can fund businesses. And that's an important piece of disruption. 
And on the geography part, you were very early in putting your stakes down in LA, particularly in Malibu, which is now like an echo center of smart people in the investment world. When you did it, the Center for Alternative Investing was in New York and Silicon Valley. But now, as you say, it's everywhere. And LA has become a really hotbed for entrepreneurship. I think a lot of that has to do with you and some of the smart people around there and also with content that's coming out of some of the studios. Peter Thiel left Silicon Valley to come to LA. Why is everyone going to LA? Is it the good surfing or is it the network of people that are coming there? It's always been quality of life. I mean, I worked in finance and banking in New York and London and Singapore and and other places. And LA just has an incredible quality of life, incredible weather, incredible climate, mountains, ocean, etc. I think people have recognized that and started moving here. And COVID, again, has accelerated everything. And so when people could work from home, they said, well, I work from home in Greenwich or Palo Alto. I'll go do it down in L.A. or Malibu. And I know a lot of people that came down here and did the work from home thing, rented a house and hung out for a couple of months and said, oh, my God, this is incredible. I'm staying and have moved there. And then they bring their friends and their friends see it. And so that's the trend that has happened. But you've also seen a lot of people leaving California, going to Austin and Miami because of taxes and, and cost of living. So, you know, the world's constantly in flux. You've got to keep your finger on your pulse. You've got to constantly be traveling, constantly be talking to people to figure out where things are going. But as far as L.A. goes... It's really quality of life. And there's just tons of great people here, too. I think L.A. is the new London in the sense that London used to be the place where the global jet set got together because the non-doms were there and it was just a global place. But Brexit has kind of killed that. And L.A. kind of has taken up the mantle in that respect, that there's just constantly people coming through, entering people coming through L.A. People love it here. Yeah, and your last conference was in Austin, and I did not understand how wonderful that was and how many venture capitalists and hedge fund managers are migrating there as well. We try to host our events where the world's going to be hot next. And in 2014, if you remember, we did it in Miami. And Miami got completely bombed out after 2008, 2009 to 16, 17 were like really dark years for South Florida. But in 2014, 2015, 2016, we did the Miami events there and really caught the upswing of Miami. And then we moved it to L.A., where we thought Silicon Valley was getting too expensive. The traffic was horrible. The quality of life was declining. And people were going to start moving to L.A., which they did. And so we did a couple of events here in L.A. And then we were planning around 2020 to do Austin. We thought Austin was the next hot spot. COVID kind of shut our events piece of our business down for a couple of years. And then we just did it a month ago in Austin. And and it's incredible how much that has blown up that city in terms of people, technology, hedge funds, investors, art, soccer, all kinds of cool stuff. So you recent Clock Tower recently launched an initiative to look at venture investments in ESG around climate change. Tell me about that. I know I'm very interested. We all are interested in ESG. We have to be. I was just with my daughter in San Diego. She's a marine ecologist and she scared me about the heating of the ocean. So what is the strategy that you're going to be using and what kind of innovation are you looking at that will address the ESG issues? Yeah, I mean, we think climate sustainability is the next big decade-long trend. And this is kind of a confluence of Marco and our strategy team having a view, our clients signing up for Net Zero 2050 and, and saying, hey, guys, we've signed up for this thing. We don't know how to do it. Can you help us figure it out? Climate had a big moment 20 years ago with Vina Kosla and Kleiner investing in, in a bunch of climate strategies, and none of them worked. So then that world was bombed out and uninvestable for 20 years. We think now is the time to invest in early stage private technologies and climate sustainability because it has shifted from like, I care about the environment, I don't want to have straws, I don't want to see life caught in fishing nets, to government level concerns like China, US, Europe have to focus on being self-sustaining from an energy standpoint. We're going through deglobalization. And it's every man for himself right now. And and governments are going to throw tons of money at sustainability and climate as their citizens are going to start to revolt about climate issues. You mentioned Malibu, where I live. In 2018, we had a massive wildfire that burned 10% of the homes in town. And you've seen the wildfires in California and Australia and all over the world that are making people 
push their politicians in a certain direction, which is going to be spending money on sustainability. You talked about your daughter. My sister lives in Alaska, and she's a marine biologist as well. And she's also a dog musher and does the Iditarod. So in her 20 years in Alaska, she has seen climate change firsthand. And she's seen it in the fish stocks and the fish life, as well as just the climate. And all you have to look at is the average temperature of the earth for the last 50 years. Just look at that chart if you want to be scared. (laughs) And so give us an example of an early stage private company that would be interesting for an investor. I think that the thing in Ukraine with the infrastructure of Europe was depending on Russia. And so that is going to change. You know, all of a sudden nuclear is green. But give us an example of some early stage technologies that might be interesting for climate. Well, it's funny. Elon Musk does not get credit for this or claim credit for this. And I don't know why he doesn't get credit for this, but he's like one of the biggest eco warriors out there. I mean, if you think about Tesla and what he's done with with electric cars and getting off fossil fuels, it's just incredible. Like he built the world's most valuable car company and has forced every other car company to build electric cars. So that is that is amazing. It's electric vehicles. It is food tech. And so being less dependent on fish and, and animal stocks. It is energy like fusion and nuclear where you don't have to depend on pumping dinosaur bones out of the ground and burning them and warming up the atmosphere to power your lights at your house. It's all these things. And like the Russia-Ukraine stuff has really brought up the dependency of Europe on Russian energy as well as Russia and Ukrainian food stocks. And food inflation and inflation is really the kind of thing that takes down governments. We saw it with in the Middle East. And food inflation is what causes revolutions. And politicians want to, by nature, want to keep their seats and stop revolution. And so this is a critically important part of government thinking going forward. So every one of your conferences that I've been to, you always have a philanthropy that you support. You're very philanthropic. So tell us a little bit about what your core interests are in philanthropy. And if we were adding money to some case, what do you think is crucial? Well, when we put together our events and we will put together who the speaker is going to be, it's really a good part of an an investment process for us is we think about what's important in the world and where is it going and then who are the people that are doing it and how do we get to them and and then offer them a platform. And so you mentioned the woman focused on ESG and emerging markets. Everyone's thinking about ESG right now. How do you do it, especially in public markets? It's really hard to do in public markets because when you look at these ESG ETFs, they're full of Amazon and Google and, and things that aren't really ESG. And so the way she focuses on it and her framework for Emerging markets was really fascinating. Similarly, I think our core value is identifying high quality people and bringing them into our ecosystem, whether it's my team like Mark and Way or Ben on the venture side, or it is our seeds like identifying the next great macro manager or early stage technology bets or essentially founder bets. They're not technology bets, they're founder bets. Can this founder really make it happen? And we do the same thing in philanthropy. We come across people that we think are incredible. And generally, great philanthropists don't know how to raise money. Bad philanthropists know how to raise money because it just becomes like a fundraising machine that goes towards admin and more fundraising versus the actual philanthropy. So when we find someone that we think is really good that doesn't know how to raise money but are on to something interesting, we bring them to our event, put them on stage, and put them in front of a room that generally – There's trillions of dollars in the room. We throw these events and they tend to strike a nerve with a certain number of people and raise capital. And we try to continue to be supportive of them on an ongoing basis. And so we've had, for example, this year we had Him for Her, which is a group that focuses on women board members, which if you read the press, there's a shortage of women on boards. And you have certain groups, I think, like BlackRock that say, if you don't have women or minority on your board, we're not going to invest. And so there's a huge trend there. And they are helping to facilitate that trend, which we think is a great trend. We've had Village Health Works in the past, which is a Village Health Works is a friend of mine who built a uh, women's hospital in Burundi, one of the poorest countries in the world. And he's providing free health care in a country where health care is incredibly expensive. And so it's things like that, that we bring these different worlds together. I always remember this surfing with the kids. What was that? There was this group in Malibu that take kids with disabilities and handicaps surfing. And it gives their families a day of joy and what's normally probably like a, just a very difficult day-to-day existence. 
take these kids on surfboards and try to inspire them. And some of my friends from the neighborhood took over this philanthropy and they wanted to do an event. And I said, well, we'll underwrite the event and we'll put you guys on stage and we'll try to raise you money. And there's still some pictures online from that. It was an incredible day. All right. So to end this, you have been at the forefront of sort of creative thinking, which I love. And you you think outside of the box. Also, I think one time you said people like big asset managers, not small. And so the enemy of performance is large and you've remained nimble. And you just started the ESG. I was just curious, what's in the future? You have areas that you're interested in launching others. Is there another book coming with your creative insights What are you focused on now? Your mind works in many ways. So I was just curious, what's next or what's the passion right now? I think our place is pretty full right now. I mean, COVID slowed things down for us a little bit in terms of events. And so this year we've done two and about to do our third. And those are always a heavy lift. We've got a lot going on with seeding, with China, with fintech, with climate. And so we're, we're running pretty hard right now. That said, I don't want to do things I don't want to do. I don't want to be bored. And when things interesting come across our plate, we have a very open mind. We're very entrepreneurial and we'll do things that interest us. I think with clients, you get the clients you deserve, not the ones you don't deserve. And so clients that are open to our style of investing are great. But what's next? I don't know. We'll see. The world's fascinating right now because we've kind of been hiding under our beds for the last two years and all of a sudden are coming out. And anyone's assumption of where the world is going is probably wrong right now because their assumption of where the world was going two years ago was wrong and is often wrong. That's why being open-minded and flexible is really great. And we're all coming out from our COVID cocoons and the world is changing in many ways that are hard to predict. And being open-minded to that is, I think, the most important thing right now. I'm pivoting a little bit to protect capital rather than to shoot the lights out. I think it's time to really protect capital. Is there anything else that I missed that I should be asking you? I thought we were going to have a battle on endowments, but anything I missed? Endowments. You and I have joked about this. People think endowments are the smart money, and I disagree. I think endowments are often run by committee and of a dozen smart people in the room that are paid a lot of money that give money to the obvious stuff. And committees kind of push people towards that direction. That's why I think you've always been interesting is that you've, you're have you a little bit more of an out-of-the-box thinker with your art background and your finance background versus coming up through traditional channels and make bold decisions versus committee-driven decisions. So I think that's really the argument that you and I have had. But again, we don't have many endowment clients. We have a couple, and those are the ones that we think are smart, and that's great. Well, it's been a pleasure to interview you. And as I said, I consider you a thought leader in the investment world. And I think people should pay attention to uh, your research and what you're doing. It's really amazing. Thanks, Paul. It's an honor to be interviewed by you, who I think are a legend in the investment space and someone I really look up to. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and maybe even piqued your interest to explore further. See you next time.